I've made this video of the restoration of a number 4 Mark I Lee Enfield sniper rifle. The rifle was built in 1943 right in the middle of the last world war and when I started work on it it was in very poor condition but after the restoration it's now in a very serviceable condition and I hope you enjoy watching the video. The Lee Enfield sniper rifle is basically a number 4 Mark I battle rifle and it was selected from the production line because of its superior accuracy and those rifles selected were sent to the London gun maker Holland and Holland where they were further accurized and they were fitted with a cheek piece a telescopic sight and an American leather sling, an M1907 sling. The rifle and the telescopic sight are carefully paired as unique fitting so therefore the number of the scope is stamped on the butt of the rifle. Now these rifles are extremely rare and they're highly collectible and for that reason there have been a number of forgeries. I bought this rifle at an auction and it doesn't have all the markings of some of the later models but nevertheless I believe that this is a genuine sniper rifle. Well here's the rifle and as I mentioned in the introduction it's in pretty rough shape you know for a sniper rifle it simply just hasn't been looked after. It's a 1943 uh, sniper. The scope is missing and the woodwork is pretty pretty beaten up and there's some minor rust on it very minor rust which is encouraging. It has an original original M1907 leather strap. It's dried out and, and it's cracked in some areas which I'll have to repair but otherwise you know once I lube it up and uh, clean it it should come up pretty good. Uh, the rifle has all, all the conventional sniper rifle uh, markings on it. There's the TR mark which is designated for a sniper. There's the uh, Holland and Holland S51 mark and there's also the the original scope number on the butt. It wasn't until 1944 that they um, they settled on all the markings uh, for the sniper rifles and this one it doesn't have a T on it and it also doesn't have the punch marks on the screws which were conventional later on. You can see also that uh, on the rear sight the battle sight has been ground off so that the scope fits over it. It's also got uh, as you can see here, the the magazine cut off, which they must have used some of the older timber. But there's no magazine uh, cut off in here, but uh, but the timber's there, prepared for it. It's not just what's on the rifle that makes me feel that it's it's an authentic uh, sniper. It's also what isn't on there. I mentioned. The punch holes aren't on the screw threads or the screw heads at, at this point and, and, and this point. But uh, consistent with a 1943 rifle, they didn't put punch marks on the screws and they're not here. And also to put, put a T, uh, a gothic T stamp it, uh, on the face there, uh, it's not difficult to get hold of one and it's not difficult to stamp one on. The front guard screw is, um, is stock, which is also consistent with a rifle, uh, a sniper rifle in 1943. Uh, later rifles had a swivel screw put on here. Now you could, you can buy one for 20 pounds on eBay and simply screw it in. But this rifle doesn't have one and that's consistent with a 1943 sniper. The mechanism is superior to, to most Lee Enfields. It's unbelievably smooth and operates uh, absolutely beautifully. 
which also makes me believe that some work has been done in that area. Now when I do get a scope for the rifle, the scope I know will fit precisely into these two threads. These are original attachments for a scope, they're in the correct positions and, and I bet when I put that scope on it'll just simply screw in. I removed the cheek pad and it's covered with a thin layer of putty. Anyway, the reason I took the pad off is to compare the condition of the wood under the, the, the pad to the remainder of the butt. And uh, as you can see, it's clear that the wood has sustained very little damage, which tells me the pad was put on early in the rifle's life and, and this supports an original sniper and not a forgery. You know, I've got a feeling the rifle's going to come up really well. You know, I look down the bore and it, it's really black and, and cruddy in there, uh, which is a worry because I don't know what the rifling's like. And there's also this nasty crack here. You see it? Uh, which in itself, you know, somebody's repaired it. You see a couple of pegs down there, which is a conventional type of repair. So it looks as if it was done professionally. It's not a botched job. But you wonder why it cracked in the first place. You know, you wonder what's going on in here, whether there's bedding issues. I don't know. But uh, when I open up the rifle, I'll, I'll be able to check it out. So it's hard to know where to begin. I think where I'll start is uh, I, I need to clean the barrel out to satisfy myself that uh, that there is some good rifling in there and that the, and that the uh, rifle will be usable. I need to start looking for a scope and I need to start working on um, this leather strap. Also, you know, the wood has got a lot of character. By the, by the word, by, by character I mean it's really well beaten up. So, you know, you don't want to remove all the character, however it needs to be a lot more presentable than this so I need to clean it up to uh, a reasonable extent uh, without without ruining the look of the rifle so I better get on with it I seal the muzzle and I fill the barrel up with gun bore cleaner just to soften up the deposits I let it stand for about 12 hours and this is the result. After, after giving the rifle a good soaking, you know, we need to get pretty aggressive. Uh, there's years of crud in there, all dried up, and now hopefully quite soft. So you need to take um, uh, a good bronze brush and uh, take the handle off your normal ramrod and uh, put it in the end of a put it in the end of a drill, just like that. and start cleaning. And you need to clean from both ends of the rifle. Um, because the, uh, the, the, the build up will be on, on, on uh, both sides of the rifling. Uh, you also need a generous uh, quantity of WD-40 up the barrel. Uh, so that it's good and lubricated. And to clean out the chamber, I use this brush for, uh, it's actually for a 45. And it does a really nice job on, on cleaning out the chamber, getting it nice and shiny. Here, here's the results of the cleaning. Um, all of this came off just by wiping the wire brush and the, uh, and the rod. Um, we got a number, of, a number of patches which were well covered with old copper. Uh, and then we started to get into more grease uh, and as we got further it got cleaner and cleaner 
but you can see the riflings becoming more prominent as we go along I mean the riflings it's clear enough on the on, on the copper sample but uh, as we got cleaner and cleaner it got sharper and sharper well here's a shot up the barrel it's the best I can do it's not it's not that good it's very difficult to get a a good shot there but you can see the rifling you can see it's pretty clean and uh, maybe I'll fire a few shots through it before I tear the rifle down and uh, here's the bore uh, using a different colored light yeah, you can see the rifling more clearly Just to be a bit more rigorous, I uh, drove a lead plug through the barrel so I could get an imprint of the rifling. And clearly it's still pretty solid. Uh, it measured about 4 thou compared to 5 when it was new. And 4 thou is more than enough to maintain the rifle's accuracy. Uh, here, here's the results of a few shots I took at the range before I, t I stripped the, the rifle down. And... Um, I suppose for a, for a weapon of that age, plus the condition it's in, I'd say it's remarkable. But uh, that won't fix many of the issues that need fixing. From, from inspecting these spent casings, it's clear that the mechanism has poor headspace. You can see this uh, because the primers have popped out during firing. I measured it and it's about seven, seven thou. Now this means I'll probably need to change the bolt head from a zero to either a number one or a number two. In order to check the interface between the barrel and the wood, I put this piece of paper under the barrel and you can see that the barrel, it free floats from the beginning of the barrel uh, right down to the muzzle area. Uh, and that's what it's designed to do. And in this area, the barrel is designed to move laterally, uh, right and left, and upwards, but not downwards, because the wood is to provide a four or five pound uplift at this, at this point. Uh, now this barrel, it, it behaves correctly apart from moving to the right. It's binding on the right. Something's making it bind on the right. Uh, whether it's the wood is warped it's, uh, or this metal that surrounds the front here has taken a bang and is pushing it in or it could be bedded incorrectly up, up here at the action area. Anyway, I need to find out and uh, why it's doing that and correct it. Uh, on the barrel you can see where the blue has been worn off at the bottom so you can see that up pressure has been uh, wearing on the bottom of the barrel as you'd expect but you can also see the wear on the right hand side so it must have been pushing up against that right hand side of the wood for some time uh, the barrel the barrel is uh, all the blue is still on there it's in it's in really good condition also around the mechanism there's you know the bluing is most of it is still there you know, it's not worn off like a lot you see on, on, on older rifles. I mean, it's worn inside, of course, but not on the outside. It's, it's in pretty good condition. Um, you also got the serial numbers written on the barrel. I got the butt off. It was quite a job. It was also quite a job taking the butt plate off. I don't think it had been off before, and it's, it's full of sand. Just wondered if this rifle was used in the desert. Who knows? Um, here again, you can see the um, the the serial numbers have been stamped on the inside uh, of the timber. So there's the bolt. It's the the rustiest thing I've found on the on the rifle. In fact, I haven't really found any rust anywhere apart from here. I don't think it's been out before, and the thread is good. So. The bolt's still good, but there is rust on it. It's trying to run away from me. I, I had to do quite a bit of work around the rifle's action. That's the bolt and, uh, and the lugs that it reacts on. Uh, earlier I showed you 
how, how the bullet's primers had popped out about 7 millimeters. Well this caused us quite a bit of uh, damage. What this means is the rifle's action has been changed from a, a, essentially a static condition to a dynamic one. And now that's basically the difference between pushing and hammering. You see, the bolt was flying back 7 thou and hitting the lugs. And now this momentum causes significantly more force than, than, the, than the static condition that it was designed for. The bolt's been damaged because of the um, the poor headspace with the bolt slamming back. So you'll see that um, when I mark up uh, the lugs, the lug on the left is taking some bearing and the lug on the right is taking no bearing at all. Uh, so, you know, I've got no choice other than to file down the lug on the left so that the lug on the right gets some bearing and also put on um, a larger bolt head. I do have some bolt heads. I've got a number one and uh, a number two. The original is a zero, so hopefully that should do it. So I've been pretty busy with the uh, bolt situation. I managed to grind down the high lug and put a new bolt head on and you can see now that I'm getting even response or even bearing on both of the lugs. Well here's the bolt and I fitted a number two bolt head to it. You can see it's it's a really good fit. It doesn't over rotate like a, a number of uh, uh, other Lee Enfield bolt heads. I also tried a, a number one bolt head, and these are the dimensions, uh, and it's, 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 it was three thou bigger than the original zero. Uh, the final bolt head that I used, the number two, is seven, seven thou bigger, which is a perfect fit. There'll, there'll be no more of this dynamic movement uh, in the action as a result. Um, what can I say? Sorry about the coffee stain. In my effort to bring back the rifle's action and the bolt to a good working condition, I built up quite a collection here. I have uh, another bolt here which is a very similar vintage to the original uh, and it's got a number one bolt head on it and it's also a perfect fit so I've got two working bolts. And uh, I don't know, I've got a, a bolt here made by Savage and I only bring that up to talk about bolt heads and some of the problems we run into. The, the bolt head on the Savage screws into the, the Savage, but it won't screw into either of these two. Uh, and I have another bolt head here, which is a number one, and I can't see what's wrong with the thread. I don't think anything's wrong with the thread. It's really weird. But it won't screw into any of these bolts, none of them. Um, also, uh, you will notice these bolts, bolt heads, they, they don't have um, an, ex, an extractor on them. You can see it there on the original. Um, or spring. Um, so I need to fix that up. And I have a couple of aftermarket springs here uh, for the extractors and I'll fit those in uh, later on. Uh, what I will mention about bolts and bolt heads when you're buying them is that um, uh, they're all worn. The bolts are worn, the bolt heads are worn, uh, so you need to be really careful to make sure you're getting exactly what you want and, and you need to bring a, a good set of uh, calipers with you when you do your shopping. i come to a stage now uh, with the rifle, with the rifle in pieces that is, where uh, I really need to assemble it again. I've done a significant amount of work on cleaning up the wood and the metal. Um, I've fixed the headspace issue and the bolt, the, uh, the uneven lugs, and um, I've done some repair at the end of the fore end. So 
I'll show you all of that now. Um, then I'll re reassemble the rifle and uh, um, take it to the range again to see how it's behaving. Well, here, here's the rifle ready for assembly. And uh, it's all in good condition now. Uh, the wood, I, I spent quite a lot of time cleaning it up and taking the dents out of it and polished it again with linseed oil um, and then finished it off with beeswax polish. Um, and even after steaming out a lot of the dents, there's still a lot of character there. It looks really nice actually. And you can see as well that the, the blue on the end of the rifle, the four piece for instance, the bluing is still really nice. Uh, it's not corroded or messed up. However, at the end here, I did have to do quite a bit of work to even it up. Somebody had filed the end of it uh, and it was crooked. I suppose that the screwed up bolt and the, um, and the headspace issue, I think it had caused a lot of problems and somebody maybe had gone after the wrong answer here. Made, they made this end here uneven, so I've had to put a brass plate in. Uh, to get it even again. It's nice tight fit now. It's working well. Um, the barrel fits nicely down uh, to this point and I'm getting four pounds uplift at that point and it's pretty central so I think that'll be good too. But I will take it to the range again and just see how that's behaving and in fact I'll paint um, this end of the barrel black uh, just to see where it's bearing when I shoot it and just make sure that it's just bearing on the bottom. The barrel's in good condition. All this metal here is in excellent condition. Uh, the bolt is well polished as you'd expect for smooth operation and that's that new bolt head that I put on. Uh, the lugs are, are now bearing nicely. Uh, these bands, I'm, I'm putting uh, some brass inside simply to get a real tight fit on the wood. Um, but the bolt, you know, that rust, I've taken it off and I actually I'll, I'll spray this black, I'll paint it black before I reassemble the rifle. Um, trigger guard's in good condition, it's good and flat. Here's the rear sight, nicely blued toward the enemy as you can see. And there's the magazine which works beautifully. I've mentioned that before. Obviously it's seen some use. But it's still in very nice condition. I mentioned earlier on the springs for the hold head, for the extraction. Uh, those aftermarket springs that I bought were useless. They, they weren't sprung steel at all. It looked like sprung steel, but it was actually, I think some of it was high tensile or quite a tough old carbon steel. Anyway, once you bent them, they stayed bent. So I was really annoyed by that. So this is where I put some paint on the, um, on the barrel just to see where it's bearing. Uh, oh, I take the gun apart again after I've fired it a few times to see uh, uh, where, where that paint gets marked up hopefully just on, on the bottom. There's the bolt painted up again as I said I would. Now here's one last look at the markings on the butt uh, before I assemble the rifle. That's the original scope number and there's the serial number on the butt in there. And on the upper wood you can see there's the, you can just about make out where the armourer has marked the serial number in pencil in there. And also in here, see it? So I'll assemble the rifle now and I'm also making some headway with getting a scope. 
and that'll that'll complete the rifle itself. So I'll get back to you once I've assembled it and hopefully got a scope for it. One of the first things I, I set out to do was to restore the original M1907 leather sling that was issued with the rifle. But unfortunately I, I was un unable to do this. The um, leather had dried out over the years to the extent that some of the cracks in it were, were more or less all the way through. And even though I introduced a lot of flexibility back into the leather, it's, it's completely unserviceable. So I'll just keep that sling as a record of what was issued with the rifle originally. Uh, the good news is uh, I could use that original sling as a template for making a new one and that's what I did. Here's the old strap. You can see I've, I've got a lot of the flexibility back into it by putting needs foot oil on it. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, as you can see here, some of some of the cracks are, you know, more or less all the way through. And, and uh, up at this end, it has in fact broken. Um, so it, it's it's completely unserviceable. But but I'll keep it. Uh, the new strap that I made is exactly the same fittings as the original. And I've used exactly the same stitching too, standard stitching for the ends. Here on the keepers. I use the same details, these, these lines running down either side. So this new strap is serviceable and it's the one that I'll use. Now you may be wondering why, why such an expensive and complicated leather sling is attached to a sniper rifle in wartime when um, you know this is this is the standard sling that's attached to a uh, to a Lee Enfield. It's really simple and really cheap, whereas this sling is really complicated and really expensive. But there's a good reason for it, and the reason for it is to stabilize the rifle uh, for the soldier who's shooting in the, in the standing position or in the numerous sitting positions that they use. Uh, now this is the sling in its presentation form, uh, and it's easily converted to, to its carrying form, as you can see. But the real reason for this sling is, is to stabilize the rifle. And that's done by putting your arm through this bottom part of the sling, uh, tightening the sling well down on your arm, putting your hand through here and through that part of the sling, and there you have it. It's extremely stable. You see this bottom part of the sling here uh, pulls the rifle butt into the shoulder pocket and this front part of the sling pulls the rifle back into the shoulder pocket. So that's why it was used. You see, you, with, with, your, with your cheek weld here, uh, the only way you can move the rifle is to move your body, same as when you're firing a shotgun. And that's the perfect way uh, to stay uh, in good position. So that's why we have this expensive 1907 sling um, which again is easily put back into the uh, presentation position. Now the US Marines they usually knot, they undo this bottom part of the sling and uh, knot it with the frog or the clasp here and leave it loose. The British Army, the standard way of doing it is the way I showed you and that's why they attach this leather sling as standard issue to the Lee Enfield sniper rifle. And just for interest I'll add that at the back of the 1942 British Small Arms Training Manual there's a section that covers the uh, sniper rifle and this includes the use of the sling.
But I've waited some time for a scope for this rifle, and I do. I now I have one, and and here it is. It's a number 32 Mark One, and it's only 134 numbers later than the original scope. So it's it's as near original as you can get. And as I predicted earlier. It's a perfect fit. So there she is. Here's a close up view of the scope. Uh, it's been restored to a fully operational condition. The restoration was by, by Roger Payne, who also supplied the scope. Roger's a renowned expert on the Lee Enfield sniper rifle. The adjustment for windage is on the left of the scope. Each click corresponds to two MOA or two inches in a hundred yards which is quite a big movement and the drums marked for every second click the adjustment for range is marked in hundred yard increments uh, from one one hundred to a thousand yards and it has intermediate clicks of fifty yards so you can dial in fifty one hundred one hundred and fifty yards etc uh, these little bolts on top, they work themselves loose if you don't glue them in. Uh, I, I wonder what they did with the originals. And that bubble that I put on there, that's not original of course, it's on there because I've got a bad habit of canting the rifle and the rifle isn't an ornament. Um, you know, I shoot it. So that's why that's there. It's a beautifully restored piece of work. Well here we go. The proof of the puddings in the eating I suppose. Let's have a look. Before I go start going through the results, I'll just show you these uh, spent casings here. Uh, and you can see that the primers now are perfectly flush. So all, all that work that I did uh, on the action and on, on the bolt head has paid off. All I'm doing here is I was messing with the range drum and I adjusted it from 0 to 500 um, aiming at this point uh, and it moved the bullet uh, fairly regular intervals all the way up about 6 inches. That's 6 inches on a, on a target that was at 25 yards. Uh, I then moved on to zero the rifle at 100 yards and I started off with these two bullets here, these two holes here, six inches left and five and a half inches high, and then I I adjusted and to two and a half inches high, but still six inches left, and then I adjusted it again uh, to this nice little group over here, which is a two-inch group, a half inch high and sorry, a half inch left and two inches vertical. Um, but now I, I after that I need to use a special tool uh, to move the reticle inside the scope uh, and it's quite a complex business I'll talk about that a little bit later and then I moved on to um, this group here which is five within two inches and six within three inches um, for a zero at 
100 yards. Uh, you can see I'm not the best shot in the world, but then again I don't profess to be. Having shot the rifle with this scope, there's a number of things I can tell you about the scope. Uh, but right off the bat I'll tell you, the only thing it's got in common with a modern scope is that it magnifies the target. There's no adjustment to the focus on this scope. It, it's fixed at 3, which is pretty low compared to a modern scope. Um, and also you need perfect, perfect long and short sight to operate this scope. I think you, if you bear in mind that when, when you look at a target with a scope, you're not looking through the, t through the scope to the target. The target is actually reflected on a lens within the scope. So if your eye's here, which it is about there, and the target's there, you need good short sight. Um, uh, and if you wear like bottle end glasses for reading, then you need to wear your bottle end glasses when you're firing this rifle. And of course, when you've got reading glasses on, like I have when I use this scope, it's very hard to, to ensure that the scope is dead central on the target. So, you know, you're moving around all the time and you're seeing shaded edges uh, uh, coming and going uh, for the scope. Now, to adjust the crosshairs uh, um, or, or, or uh, reticle in the scope, you need this tool here, which is the tool from hell. You actually need three hands to operate this tool, you know, which it goes on to the reticle adjustment here and then the outer, the outer section is, is to undo the lock. But when you undo the lock, you move the reticle. And when you move the reticle, you, tend to, you, can, you can actually start locking the thing again. It is truly the, 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 the tool from hell. It needs two people to operate it, or three hands. And that's what you use uh, for both your windage and, and your vertical sight. But... What I will say is, this scope, for, for its time, it was designed in the, in the late 1930s, it's, it's, an ex it's a really robust piece of equipment. You know, they drop these rifles from airplanes. Um, uh, every time you undo it and put it back on, it, it, it lines up perfectly with the rifle. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fantastic piece of engineering for its time. And it's, it's significantly better than iron sights. Of course, that's depending on the shooter, not me. You know, some young guy with 20-20 vision. Well, I certainly enjoyed restoring this old rifle. And I enjoyed making the video. And, and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed watching it. Thanks.